So uh, just a few words about the startup showcase that's about to start. So we wanted to, um, I guess, use the fact that we're all here together to um, uh, give an opportunity to some of the most exciting startups in the space to show what they're working on. And so we opened this to, um, to everyone to, to apply. Uh, we had uh, probably about 70, 75 entries in the last three weeks. We opened it about three weeks ago. And we chose 10 companies to, to be part of the Startup Showcase. So we had a panel of, um, uh, a selection panel, if you like, made up of um, uh, angels and VCs. Um, so I want to thank them for all the work they did in um, helping us uh, choose the uh, Star Showcase winners. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, introduce the first one, which is called Bit Rated. So Nadav, I think it's over to you. Hey, my name is Nadav. It's working? Yeah. My name is Nadav. I'm a software developer. And as he said, I'm the founder of Bitrated. And I came to tell you a little bit about what we are doing and the problems we are trying to solve. So one of the key factors preventing Bitcoin from, from reaching mainstream adoption is the lack of proper consumer protection mechanisms. When you're buying online with a credit card, if you fall victim to online fraud, you can get into a dispute with the merchant or never get your product, you can always contact your credit card company, explain to them what happened, and issue a chargeback. With Bitcoin, transactions are irreversible. There is no central authority like Visa that supervises the network and is able to issue chargebacks. While this is a good thing for many cases, and the lack of central authority is the main idea behind Bitcoin, it does make it very problematic to safely buy goods and services online, especially from new, unknown, or untrusted merchants. Uh, Bitcoin requires complete trust in the goodwill of the merchants and give you no assurance that after making the payment, you will actually receive what you paid for. The irreversibility of transactions, in addition to the anonymity that Bitcoin provides, created a growing problem of scams that leave consumers with little to no recourse. There are thousands of reported fraud cases in the various Bitcoin communities, and even forums and subreddits dedicated to reporting them. On the other end, in the traditional financial system, we see the exact opposite situation. Transactions are sometimes too easily reversible. The dispute resolution process of companies like Visa and PayPal is at times very mechanic and bureaucratic, and in many cases, they just prefer to protect the consumer, even on the expense of the merchant. This causes the opposite problem of buyer fraud, where a consumer buys a product, gets the product, then issues the chargebacks and gets to keep both the money and the product. Uh, buyer fraud is a very serious issue for merchants, costing them tens of billions of dollars a year, and again, leaving them with little recourse, especially small medium businesses and private sellers. So on the one end, we have Bitcoin, where transactions are irreversible, leading us to seller fraud, and on the other end, we have the traditional system, where transactions are too reversible, leading us to uh, buyer fraud. My question is, can we find a middle ground? Can we create a dispute resolution system that can protect both consumers and merchants and be fair to do both of them? I believe that the answer is yes, and I will show you how Bitcoin and Bitrated is able, to, <coughs> is able to help achieve exactly that and solve not only the problem in the Bitcoin world, but also improve upon what we have available in the traditional financial system. Bitrated attempts to resolve those issues using three primary components. A payment system that allows for arbitration and reversible payments, an open marketplace for arbitration services, and a, and a, a reputation management and trust network system. The payment system allows buyers and sellers to use a trusted third party, an arbitrator, that can intervene in case of dispute, investigate the case, decide who is right and who gets to keep the money. This is done using a web interface that provides access to two of three multi-signature transactions. Basically, the buyer starts by making a payment to the multi-signature address, a sort of a side deposit where the payment is kept until the transaction ends. The seller can see the payment is secured in the multi-signature address and provides the goods or the service to the consumer. At this point, in order to release the funds from the multi-signature address, the agreement of two of the three parties is needed, the, the three parties being the buyer, the seller, and the arbitrator. This has a few interesting properties. First of all, when everything goes well and the buyer is satisfied, he and the seller can themselves be the two of three and don't need the arbitrator to intervene at all. They sign a transaction that moves the funds from the multi-signature address to an address controlled by the seller. 
The arbitrator doesn't even have to know that anyone ever used these services. More importantly, the arbitrator doesn't hold any funds. He can control them in any way without the agreement of either the buyer or the seller and can't use them for his own purposes. Basically, all he gets is a voting right that can tip the outcome in the favor of either the buyer or the seller. Bitrated does not provide arbitration services itself. The goal is to create an open marketplace for arbitration services where anyone can compete for customers by offering quality services, innovative dispute resolution techniques, competitive fees, and uh, building a good reputation. Creating an open marketplace like that was traditionally very problematic because the arbitrator was required to hold the user, the user funds in escrow. Because of the high level of trust you need to have in escrow providers, escrows are strictly regulated in most parts of the world and have a very high cost of operation due to securities, bonds, licensing requirements, and so forth. Uh, Bitcoin allows arbitrators to offer dispute resolution services without holding user funds and without using an escrow. And I think that this is the really important point here that highlights the beauty of Bitcoin as programmable money. By lowering the amount of trust you need to have in the arbitrator, you can avoid, <coughs> excuse me, you can avoid the escrow regulations, lower the barrier to entry, and allow to create a competitive market where new, smaller, and specialized players can compete for customers in a way that the traditional system simply cannot allow. Uh, we believe that a competitive market like that can vastly improve the quality of the dispute resolution services compared to what we have today and create a better, more comprehensive, and more fair process for both merchants and consumers. Uh, naturally, some arbitrators would lean towards helping consumers more and some arbitrators would lean towards helping merchants more, but the market can determine where is the acceptable middle point, middle ground, sorry, and which arbitrators they're willing to use. Another interesting possibility is the use of domain experts. For example, if I'm buying an iPhone application, I will use an arbitrator with a software development background so that in case of dispute, you could go over the project specifications, read the, the project source code, and use this professional knowledge to really investigate the case and decide who is right, which is something that obviously the dispute resolution process of companies we have today, like uh, PayPal, simply cannot do. Bitrated will integrate a reputation management and trust network system for buyers, sellers, and arbitrators. It will allow users to check the reputations of others, add ratings for the users they're interacting with, and build their own online reputation. It will be based around the trust network concept and will be provided via an open API for the Bitcoin ecosystem to use so that third party services that need reputation information can use that, allowing users to carry the reputation along with them as they move between services. Um, reputation information will, in the long term, will probably become more important than arbitration, as it will allow users to not get into uh, transactions with problematic sellers for, for the first place. That's it. I think we still have some time for questions, if anyone has any. Yeah. Yeah, so we are working on an API to allow third-party services to use the payment system. Uh, there are a lot of marketplaces today that are still using escrow. And yeah, we got a lot of marketplaces and services that want to utilize the multi-signature transactions. And so we're working on an API that will allow that. And we'll be glad to talk and see if we can help each other somehow. Hello, um, excuse me, beyond uh, reputation, is there anything to discourage collusion with the uh, arbitrators? I'm sorry, again? Is there anything to discourage collusion between one of the parties and the arbitrator? Um, well, mostly reputation. Uh, if you would work with an arbitrator this is, that is very reputable and has a lot of reputation and history, you wouldn't want to harm his reputation for that. But basically, yeah. Uh, you're basically shifting the issue from one party, like the seller or the escrow provider, that can be a part of the scam that to having to have two different parties that collude together. Yeah. Why not go straight to reputation-based mechanisms rather than arbitration? I'm sorry, again? Why not go to the, the reputation-based system directly and not use arbitration as a first step to get there? Sound like that you had a sequence of Okay, technology so advancement. Reputation, reputation could work well in the long term after merchants and consumers are they have some history and some ratings, but a new merchant that starts selling today 
and doesn't have any history, and you know, the arbitration could really help there. And we're still in the stage with Bitcoin where you still don't have, there are still a lot of people selling stuff and buying stuff who are not very well known. So an arbitration at this point, I think, is more important. But as I said, in the long term, I think reputation management is going to take a more central part. Yeah. No, it doesn't require it. We are going to add it as an option, as an opt-in for users that want to uh, verify their identification. They can do it with the service and have it displayed in their profile that they did this process, but it's not going to be required. You know, as the market sees its fit, if the market is going to require people to do that, then more people are going to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sean Slows. I'm the CEO of a company called Atlas ATS. Um, we're basically a Wall Street proven exchange. Our main focus has been trying to bring Bitcoin to Wall Street. And that, that would be traditional asset managers, <clears throat> that would be brokers, prop shops, and et cetera. We started about a year ago. Um, we're live now in, in both the US and Hong Kong. But one of the, uh, I guess, the challenges we've been going through is getting a lot of Main Street, Wall Street to understand what Bitcoin is. So one of the things that um, um, over the course of the year, Bitcoin has really appreciated a lot in price, and I think a lot of uh, positive news um, has been coming out, a lot more um, companies adapting it and everything else. So generally when we first meet up with Bitcoin companies, we show them this chart, and I think this chart showing the, uh, how it is appreciated over the course of the year makes them understand for, if you're an investment firm or a prod firm or a market maker, um, essentially, you want to stay in alpha, you want to stay in returns. So our, our main mission is mainly to uh, get Bitcoin or any type of digital currency to trade, much like a traditional asset class like equities, options, futures, or FX. So I mean, what is Atlas? I mean, Atlas is a Wall Street proven exchange uh, or digital currency exchange platform. We've been building, um, I would say, this platform over the last four or five years for a lot of Wall Street firms. We're uh, securely designed. Um, the way we operate today is we run in secure data centers, all different types of uh, security measures built into our software. We're heavily compliance driven, obviously with AML, AML KYC, which is required in Bitcoin. We're, 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 we've dealt with a lot of the regulatory rules that the CFTC, the SEC uh, require on uh, your, your traditional uh, asset classes. Um, we're also designed for maximum liquidity. Our model is a global model where we're building out liquidity points around the world and linking them together. So um, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, if you look at it today, we focus on two primary areas. We focus in the exchange space where you have um, buyers and sellers come to match. We also focus on the financial services where we're acting as a broker, we're providing walleting services, we're providing the ability to, uh, I say this carefully, <laughs> convert uh, digital currency to fiat and fiat to digital currency. Um, there's a lot of areas uh, within Bitcoin, a lot of different type of companies trying to solve a lot of problems. Our main uh, focus is to provide exchange technology and a great ecosystem. Um, so when speaking to a lot of the uh, Wall Street firms um, in, in terms of um, adapting a platform and using it, we, we um, essentially asked them a lot of questions and what they gave back a lot of feedback was on the major ones out there that are listed, um, prices are not consistent between exchanges. It can vary widely. Um, exchanges are very regionally focused, limited liquidity, um, and, and lack of a lot of different currency support. Um, also, the problem of obviously everybody's experience is transfer from fiat to Bitcoin and Bitcoin to fiat. And, and also, the technology was not developed to be enterprise uh, level where it scales where it has you know, the ability to fail over, be 100% redundant. So a lot of reservation on these, these, these entities to um, get into Bitcoin trading because of these problems. Um, the, the other criteria we, which we listed here, um, which has really made us think about the model that we're building out, is liquidity, volume and price stability. You, you need uh, price discovery and, and a, a large amount of coins to trade. 
proximity where they're located, if it's in somewhere in Eastern Europe or somewhere in Asia, and you're US-based or Canadian-based, you really don't want to do business over there. Security, I mean, uh, am I going to have to wake up and find out the exchange was taken down by a denial of service attack or wallets were stolen? And also, what are the regulations? I mean, obviously, I'm trading within the US, or I'm trading within Europe or Asia. How do I comply and how do I adapt it? Also, what is the fee structure? Are you competitive or not? How is Atlas unique? So um, the, the core platform uh, um, was built in a company called Fundamental Interactions, which I also operate. We deploy uh, FinTech technology, trading infrastructure, for exchanges and, 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 and trading for equities, options, and futures. We have over 40 firms using it from exchanges to large um, hedge funds to prop trading. And we've certified with dozens of clearing firms, and we have about 160 broker connections built out throughout North America, part in Asia, and part also as in Europe. Um, our tick to trade latency, which is probably about one of the fastest out there, is competitive against the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, about 30 mics. Uh, the other part is um, our core model is, is, is global, local, uh, public, and private. What does that mean? We have a global focus. We're building out globally around in different regions of the world. We're providing local um, businesses where we, we can convert to fiat and, and following local regulations. The uh, exchange technology on the bottom half is our core matching that Wall Street firms use today. We built out a whole new front office tier. That means we built uh, wallets. We uh, recently launched our multi-sig wallet that provides um, extremely highly secure wallets that uh, we're able to build custodian wallets out for each individual. That's a read-only wallet, and we store our keys in a separate location. We feel that it's almost virtual, um, virtually impossible to hack. We also built it coin agnostic. What that means is we can add up to 180 different coins um, to support on the exchange. Recently, we just had added um, Litecoin and some other ones as well. We have a full digital accounting system for cash and coins, which is auditable, which is very important. So we know exact balances for individuals. Everything is segregated. We all built a trading application layer, a web layer, and an HTML5 so people can access that. So this whole stack is our technology we've worked on over the last year and we recently deployed. Real simple piece, see here is our order settlement process. Everybody's familiar. The one thing that dif is different about our model is that we provide something called public and private markets. Um, private markets are companies that are trading Bitcoin or have cu uh, customers in Bitcoin. They want to operate with the members only. They want to manage their own clients. So we give the uh, software to them to deploy it. And then what we essentially do is take their best bid and offer and we put it in our public markets. We're operating two public markets today both in Hong Kong and North America. So we're trying to build up a large ecosystem of Bitcoin businesses using our platform. Uh, this is what our global network uh, would look like. So we have North America and Asia, we're working on Europe. Essentially, the way it works is we have uh, exchanges in different regions. We link them up together and synchronize them in real time to build out a global order book. So if you're coming in Asia, you're coming in North America, you essentially have a larger pool of liquidity, which price, provides price discovery, um, and you're able to hit an aggregate number of, 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 of coins. So our progress to date, we found in April 2013. Um, we started building the modules uh, in a serious way in July of 2013. Uh, the platform um, with the front end tiers all were completed in January 2014. The uh, wallets we recently deployed uh, about a couple weeks back. Um, Hong Kong and Asia we brought live. We, we, we opened up public markets, allowing institution retail and others to come in, and we're gonna be linking them up to the private markets in the coming months. Uh, the, the other thing is we about last week announced, or two weeks ago, a global deal with a company called Perseus Telecom. They're, they're a, a private network, global network, linked to 37 my financial markets. One of the things that we're trying to do, uh, the, the internet a lot of people don't perceive as it's secure, by building out a private network that the institutions use in the exchanges today to trade among themselves, we're trying to move that to, to the Perseus Telecom so people feel secure in, in transacting on our exchanges and others as well. And the, uh, the other day on Saturday, we had launched um, options for 
uh, bitcoins. Uh, essentially, we give the ability to, uh, to, to hedge. So if you want to buy puts, you want to write calls, uh, we made that available to the community to start trading. So our goals this year, essentially, we want to acquire at least 25,000 users in the public markets, have at least 10 public markets live, as well as 10 private markets. We're looking to do at least 100,000 transactions a day across the board. We filed for a New York State bit license. Um, we're also working to get an ATS license out of Hong Kong for trading. And um, we're trying to work with a bunch of uh, self-regulated uh, SRO exchanges or partner with some of the derivative exchanges regarding clearing and settlement, et cetera. Anybody have any questions? You, sir. So um, one of the things that got Bitcoin here today is retail. You, you cannot um, alienate retail or exclude them. So with the private markets, it's purely members only, institutions, brokers. The, um, the public markets, um, we are allowing, of course, um, those type of clients that just want to come in and hit a pool of liquidity. And we are bringing retail on internationally. And we're doing it limited in the United States. We're capping them at a certain amount, Bitcoin only initially. And we, what we did in the United States, we wrote all 48 states. We look for, um, for no action letters, exemptions to states. We have filed for MTLs. Uh, and, and we're looking to the CFTC as well to, to try and get some regulation out of them. Yeah, I'll answer the last one. We have a fixed API for market data order routing, pretty sophisticated. We have socket-based APIs, C++, Java, C Sharp, C. We have JSON APIs. Uh, we also have Ruby APIs, and we have web APIs. APIs. You can connect any way you want under the sun. Thank you very much. Hello Coin Summit. My name is Flavien Charlon. I'm here today to speak about uh, our new project called Coin Prism. So first, uh, let me say a few words about uh, who we are. So we are the Irish company behind Predictious. Predictious is a, a Bitcoin uh, prediction and derivatives uh, market. So it's a website where you can buy and sell predictions about future events. And if your predictions are correct, you will make a profit. So we have many different categories of events. So for example, in the politics section, you can try to predict who will be the next US president. On the derivative side, for example, you can try to predict what will be the, Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin next week. So that's a very good way to hedge a Bitcoin position, for example. Um, and we have other kinds of derivatives like altcoin derivatives and uh, Bitcoin mining difficulty derivatives as well. Uh, so we will continue to run, maintain, and invest on Predictious, but today I'm actually here to present our new project, uh, which is Coin Prism. So Coin Prism is uh, the first colored coin web wallet. So it does everything that a normal, uh, co uh, a normal Bitcoin wallet does. It can, it can store, receive, and uh, send Bitcoin, but you can also store, send, and receive colored coins. And because colored coins need to be issued in the first place, uh, Coin Prism also lets you issue the, the colored coins. So before I continue, how many people are familiar with or have heard of colored coins before? Okay, so about uh, yeah, half the people, I'd say. So I'll just describe briefly what they are. So the con concept behind colored coin is that uh, you take a Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin and you tag an additional value or secondary value on top of it, and then you can track it on the blockchain. So it's a way to store any asset and uh, transfer it through the blockchain. So there are many applications to, uh, to colored coins. One of them is making an IPO. So I could, uh, if I'm a company, I'm looking to raise some money, I could issue some shares on the blockchain in the form of colored coins and just send them to, uh, sell them to my investors. A second example would be a bullion bank. So if I'm a, a bullion bank, what I could do is whenever I accept a, a gold deposit, I give a uh, golden coin back for every ounce of gold that got deposited. And then uh, the, the person can then sell it or exchange it on the blockchain. And then eventually when the customer comes back and wants to redeem the golden coin, I give them back the, the ounce of gold. And by the way, this also works with uh, normal uh, fiat deposits. So you could have a traditional bank 
uh, accepting US dollar deposits and give US dollar coins in exchange. Uh, another example would be uh, smart properties. So I could have a lawyer draft a contract which says that the owner of a house is the person who owns a special colored coin. And then uh, I can prove that I own that coin by signing a, a message. And then I can also send that coin to somebody else, which then becomes the new owner of the house. So what are the benefits of colored coins? Um, so OK, so can, can we move to that? Yeah, thanks. So uh, the benefits of colored coins are derived from the fact that it's running on the blockchain. Um, so because it's using Bitcoin transactions, uh, you can send any asset across the world for the price of a Bitcoin transaction. And it, so it ranges from a free to a few cents. Um, the transparency, it comes from the fact that the Bitcoin is a public ledger. So if I'm a bullion bank issuing golden coins, I could, I, everybody can audit the blockchain and see how many uh, golden coins have been issuing. And they can verify that I'm not doing fractional reserve banking. Um, now, in terms of security, it's uh, like the thousands of Terra hashes that are uh, used, to, that are securing the Bitcoin network, uh, is also securing colored coins because it's running on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that wouldn't be the case with an altcoin, for example, that runs on a separate chain, uh, because it's much easier to attack in terms of the 50%. And finally, you don't need to buy a special altcoin to to use colored coins. So this is in contrast to, let's say, Mastercoin. With Mastercoin, you would have to buy the MSC currency. And so you'd have to buy it from maybe the initial uh, investors. Uh, with Counterparty, you would need to burn some Bitcoin before you can get your hands in, uh, on XCP. And you need, you need those currencies to use those protocols. So with uh, colored coins, it's different because all you need is a few Bitcoin, which you will then color. But uh, if you change your mind or you don't want to use those colored coins anymore, you always have the option to uncolor them and recover the, the backing Bitcoin. Uh, so this is more like a deposit rather than an investment you have to make. You can always change your mind. Um, yeah, so now let's see what CoinPrism looks like. So first of all, um, we launched the uh, closed beta a few days ago, so it's quite new. Um, and we plan to release the general availability in about uh, a month. So that's going to be on mainnet. The closed beta is on testnet. So let's say I'm a company and I want to raise some money uh, on the blockchain using colored coins. I'm, I'm going to show you how to do that in five minutes with Coin Prism. So first of all, I'm going to create an account. So I type some basic information. Uh, I'm going to press enter. And you can see at the bottom it says encrypting your account. So this is because the private keys are generated on the browser, on the client side, and they are being encrypted before being sent to the server. And they can only be decrypted using the password of the account, which, are, which, are, which is never sent to the, to the server. So even if the database is, com is compromised, there is no way for the attacker to get the keys. Um, so after I've created the account, uh, I, I, I end up on the wallet overview page, so I can see my balance in Bitcoin here. And I see my, my newly created address. So like, on, like with any uh, Bitcoin wallet, I can transfer uh, some, uh, some funds on that. So let's say I'm transferring one Bitcoin. I see the balance uh, update. Now I want to create uh, a color that will be used to issue the shares. So I'm going to go to the, to the addresses page and click on, uh, uh, click on new color. So I'm going to see that. So I can type a name for my color, and then I'm going to type my password. The password will be used to encrypt the, the private key that's used to issue the, the shares before being sent to the server. Now, I know after that, I get to the page where I can define some metadata about my color. So I can set a ticker name, uh, like a full name, the company name who's issuing the shares. I can upload a couple of pictures. So this metadata will be displayed on all the wallets of people who own those shares. Um, so then more metadata. So at the bottom, you can see there's an option to select uh, the number of, of uh, colored units per Bitcoin. Here I'm selecting uh, that I want to be able to issue 10, 10 million shares uh, per one Bitcoin. But this is completely arbitrary. I could choose uh, any amount uh, up to like down to one Satoshi equals one share. Um, and finally, I select the asset type, which in this case is a stock. So this metadata obviously is not stored on the blockchain. It, uh, it's stored on the web, but there is a pointer on the blockchain, which is a URL, which points to that uh, metadata. 
So when I've done this, uh, I'm now able to issue the shares. So I'm going to go to the uh, issue coins uh, page and uh, select the, the amount of Bitcoin I want to color. I press enter and I get to the screen. So on this screen, I get the ability to review the transaction. I can see uh, how much is being uh, sent and how many is being colored. And uh, if, the, if everything looks right, I'm going to type my password and this is going to uh, sign the transaction again on the client side. So the transaction is being uh, signed and then broadcasted to the, to the Bitcoin network. So when this is done, uh, my balance updates and you can see now I have 2 million shares of uh, my company. And my Bitcoin balance uh, went down from 1 Bitcoin to 0 0.8. This is because I've used 0 0.2 Bitcoin to issue the, the shares. But again, I, have the, I can always uh, uncover uh, the 2 million shares to recover the 0 0.2 Bitcoin when I, whenever I want. Uh, now, what I can do is I can send the shares to my investors. So I'm, I go to the quick send page. I'm going to type the address of my investor, um, select how many shares I want to sell, let's say, uh, or to send, let's say 100 shares. And then I'm going to send it to my, uh, to my investor. And um, so here the investor has the ability then to sell, sell them or send them to whatever they want with them. Uh, but they don't have the ability to issue the, the shares because they don't have the private key, which uh, is linked to my account. It's encrypted and uh, they would need my password to do it. Um, so yeah, to, to wrap up on that. Um, so you, if you're a developer, you're interested in the open protocol specification that we are using for colored coins, you can look it up on GitHub. Uh, it's, very, it's a very light protocol and uh, it's very simple to implement. Uh, and uh, so if you want to try the beta, you can talk to me after this and I'll give you an invitation code. Uh, and then you will be able to sign up for the beta and then we'll launch the final uh, version in about uh, a month. So if you have a few questions, you have 30 seconds. Okay, there, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to see you're focusing on the uh, storage of value. One, one of the things um, that immediately I saw Bitcoin as an application for transferring ownership of securities, are you talking to any firms today, uh, you know, in, in terms of like a DTCC about transferring ownership or any type of clearing firms or private shares or, or anything of that nature? Because it, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so quickly, just for now, the, the wallet is just the basic platform, and then we plan to work with gateways or uh, companies who will be issuing the shares. But for now, we're just concentrating on the wallet that, so that people can start using colored coins and start issuing their coins, but without providing the upper layer yet. So, yeah, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Jacob and I'm the CEO of Crowdcurity. We are disrupting IT security by basically decentralizing and crowdsourcing it. Um, but let me start by telling you a story I had back in, in the summer of 2011. Back then I was actually working as an IT consultant in Denmark and I just started came in, coming into this uh, Bitcoin space. Uh, and one morning I came into the office and I was looking through my emails uh, and I received this email from Mt. Gox. And back in 2011, Mt. Gox was actually the largest Bitcoin exchange in the world. And I just bought all my Bitcoins and I had them all deposited with Mt. Gox. So I received this email that their entire database had been compromised and then my username and password was now floating around the internet. And that sucks, right? <laughs> and I got a bit afraid. Um, but Imagine also what a pain it must have been sending out this email to all the users. Oh, maybe not for Mt. Gox, but imagine for everybody else what a pain it is sending out this email. So unfortunately, Mt. Gox isn't the only one having this issue. I mean, we see Bitcoin exchanges, Bitcoin wallets, all different types of Bitcoin businesses getting hacked every day. I mean, this is ridiculous, and it's very frustrating as an end user in this space. But what's even more frustrating and more ridiculous is that the solutions that we present to these businesses are these corporate expensive IT security consultants. So we spend $10 billion a year worldwide on IT security consultants who charge $200 an hour and we're using that to kind of fix the, the IT security. Well, it, it simply doesn't work. It's not scalable and it's very expensive. 
Basically, this is a local inefficient solution, and we are using that to fight the bad guys who works globally. And the bad guys, the hackers, they don't charge per hour. So there's just complete mismatch between kind of the solutions we got and, and the problem we are facing. So we went, we went on a mission to solve that. And we are doing that by crowdsourcing web security. So at CrowdCurity, we connect this crowd of skilled security researchers with businesses that want to improve their web security. So this is really a global solution to a global problem. Thereby, we can kind of match the threat of the, of the criminals with kind of the, the distributed defense of IT security uh, people. So we're basically building the 99 designs for IT security. So, but actually, the concept is not new. Uh, so the big guys, Facebook, PayPal, and Google, have all been crowdsourcing their security for years by running these bug bounty programs, where they pay out rewards to security testers who can find bugs and vulnerabilities in their website. But what about everybody else? Why aren't all of these Bitcoin businesses doing the same? I mean, obviously, it works. So the, the problem is that a lot of these small businesses, they, they don't have the brand like Google, and they don't have the skills and technology in-house as the big guys. So they'll need a service provider, and we're solving that because CrowdCurity basically delivers a crowdsourced security test as a service. I mean, basically, we've just taken a proven and validated concept in use today by the big guys, built a platform around it, thrown some technology in there, and we're now scaling that and delivering that to all of these Bitcoin businesses. Um, so how does it work? Well, basically, the platform we build enables any business to create a security test, to create a bug bounty program in a few clicks. So for example, Spend, Bitcoin, Spend Bitcoins, which is one of our customers at the moment, they uh, created a bug bounty program, a security test, a couple of months back, launched it all in, on our platform, kind of tap, tapping in and leveraging our crowd of security testers. So then the security testers will go to the website, start poking around, examining if they can bypass authentication, log in as other users. And if they're able to do that or find other security issues, they'll submit a bug report to, to spend bitcoins. And if any of these uh, security issues are valid, they will then reward that, bis no, that security tester with bitcoin. Um, and on our, or they can also choose to, to, to a reward in, in dollars. But at the moment, half of all, all our rewards to the security community is paid out in, in Bitcoin. So really, but, but the, the great thing here is that we are able to connect kind of the security community with businesses and doing that on a performance-based model. So our business model is to each time that uh, a reward is paid out to one of the security testers, that we charge a 20% on top of that as a service fee, like a traditional marketplace. Thereby, we are changing kind of this, this whole idea of paying per hour to performance-based model. So th that's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, and it enables that a lot of the small businesses can get started with a, without a large upfront fee um, to, to get started. So this is a, a map of uh, the security testers that we have a moment signed up on our platform. We have more than 700 security testers distributed all around the world. So imagine exposing your, your Bitcoin business to, uh, to a crowd of security testers instead of just one local IT guy coming out and don't know your technology stack, don't know the specific of your platform, to instead of a crowd of security test testers. This makes complete sense. Um, and we do have one tester in French Polynesia. Um, of course, we launched just a couple of months back and we've seen some great traction. We now have more than 30 businesses on board on our platform. Uh, and a lot of these are, of course, Bitcoin exchanges from all this all around the world. Um, so uh, that, that's pretty cool that we can help those uh, identify security issues before they are, they are being exploited. So really what we are building here is a marketplace, right? Connecting on one side all these security testers with businesses that want to improve their security. So that's pretty cool, and it's uh, very disrupting because it's, it's the end of this model of paying per hour for these corporate IT security consultants. But at CrowdCurity, we are not, uh, not only ending kind of the, the pay per hour model, we are also kind of pushing the boundaries of the whole bug bounty program or the whole concept of bug bounties. And for example, I'm very happy today to announce that next Monday we are going to launch a contest that is called Capture the Coin. And what that contest is that within our own platform, we're going to use the features of Bitcoin, really, to improve our own security. And the way we're going to do that, do that is to kind of take the Bitcoin private keys, embed them in kind of in areas of our website which are very sensitive. 
Then we're going to deposit amounts on these Bitcoin addresses depending on how sensitive we are in, in that space of our, of our application. And of course, we're going to monitor these addresses to see if there are any movements on, on these Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin addresses. And basically, what that enables us to do, if there's some intruder or some hacker coming into our platform, stealing those private keys, we get a notification, right? So we're able to monitor kind of the movements of those addresses, but it's on purpose, right? So really, we can build an intrusion detection system, but on top of using the technology of Bitcoin. So that's, that's pretty interesting because it's kind of the, the first time, I believe, in history that we can build intrusion detection system linked to monetary values. So you can imagine businesses start using this to kind of, you know, have larger and larger amounts on the associated Bitcoin accounts, the closer you get to kind of the holy grail where you store all your money. Pretty interesting, and we're happy to launch that next Monday, so stay tuned on our site for more information around uh, Capture the Coin. Um, so of course, with all these crazy ideas, you need a crazy team. Uh, we are four Vikings, we are four, four guys from Denmark, but we sailed to Silicon Valley to kind of disrupt IT security. So uh, my name is Jacob, and I'll be happy to have a chat with any of you afterwards around you know, crowdsourcing security and Bitcoin and Capture the Coin. Thank you for listening. I have one month. Well, I have one minute and 38 seconds. If there's a question, there's one question of. So the question is, uh, half of our, how are we paying the testers? So at the moment, half of our testers are paid in Bitcoin, and the other half are paid in in fiat currencies. So using PayPal, for example. But uh, some of our rewards, for example, is just sending out $25 or $100 to India or Australia, and it just makes a lot of sense doing that in, in Bitcoin instead of uh, using PayPal. Um, yeah. Is this working? Oh, uh, so at Kraken, we already have our own bug bounty program that we've been running, and so maybe you could elaborate on the advantages of uh, perhaps using CrowdCurity. Okay, yeah, so for example, so if I understand the question is, if some uh, Bitcoin businesses are already running a bug bounty program, what are the advantages of doing that on CrowdCurity? Okay, well, that's what I'm going to answer. <laughs> um, well, basically, one of the things, for example, is that if you pay our rewards for security tests, let's say in India or in Australia or whatever, you need to adhere to all these anti money laundering requirements. And that's difficult if just two guys or three guys doing a Bitcoin startup to figure out who's, who are you actually paying out your bounty to. So that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the advantages. Of course, we do stuff also that we are able, kind of, by getting scale, have a more frequent interaction with the testers to be, you know, better vet them, have a track record, and building reputation systems and stuff like that. So you can select among our crowd. That is difficult if you're just like two guys. So time is up. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Fromet, and I am the Chief Compliance Officer for InterWallet. Uh, it is an amazing product. I have been in the MSB space for 22 years in foreign currency, wire transfer, check cashing, and prepaid, and uh, on the operations side and, and on the compliance side, and I have really never seen anything like this, and it really prompted me to be part of the team. So what is it? It is an ATM on steroids. Uh, sure, there's plenty of, of machinery out there that will transact Bitcoin transactions, but we're much more. Um, we're going to be able to offer mainstream America consumers who are underbanked and unbanked, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, the ability to purchase prepaid products, such as phone cards, gift cards, prepaid debit cards, and the like using our terminal, not only in digital currencies, but with cash and prepaid debit cards or debit cards that they might carry in their wallet. Uh, it is a fully managed turnkey solution. Uh, the terminal is very green. It uses next generation web technologies. It lives in the cloud. Uh, it is Linux based. Some of you may have heard that uh, Windows is no longer 
maintaining XP and there's going to be a whole bunch of ATM machine problems, uh, we're not going to have that problem. Uh, it's in real time. If a consumer goes to a, a machine and God forbid they lose power and they're in the middle of a transaction, they can go to another terminal, enter their information and pick up where they left off. Uh, the security concepts are amazing. Uh, it's going to do plenty of checks, plenty of securities. The, the founder behind this is IT security based. Um, we're going to be following all the AML and KYC requirements. Um, a person will be able to come, they'll be able to image their identification right on our terminal. We'll take a picture if necessary. We will run background services such as ideology, and other services to confirm the identity and the validity of the transaction before we process the transaction. Of course, if it's, if it's Bitcoin related or digital currency related, we will follow the policies and procedures as guidance of FinCEN and be licensed where necessary. Uh, we are currently syncing wire transmitters licenses in Nevada, uh, my hometown, uh, and placing terminals in Nevada and other places throughout the United States. Uh, but it's much more than just digital currency. Um, we want to bring this to the masses. All of you in this room know what digital currency is, but the average consumer does not. We want to bring the ability to spend and educate consumers on digital currency and be able to use their debit card and be able to use cash as a traditional ATM machine. Uh, the machine will be multilingual. Uh, as we'll go over in a minute, we have uh, machines going to China uh, and also Latin America. So it is, it is multilingual. It will also be able to be branded individually uh, for a specific third party distributor. What does it do today? Well, we are able to sell calling cards and top-ups. We're able to sell gift cards. We're able to do prepaid debit cards. This terminal will actually issue a prepaid Visa card loaded right out of the terminal. We just recently approved, uh, uh, was, were approved by the processor to provide these services. So they'll be able to come in, take their Bitcoin, load it onto the terminal, we'll, tr we'll converse it to, to uh, what the processor will need to get paid, and they'll be able to load their debit card and walk away with a debit card with cash or cryptocurrencies. Um, the, it's endless of what we can do with this application. If you can dream it, we can do it. So for example, movie tickets, show tickets, traffic tickets, SIM cards, um, we have a potential distributor in New York who wants to issue Broadway show tickets on Broadway. So we're, whatever app that we can dream, we can do. It's an apps-based ATM. So you might go to a movie theater and, and purchase tickets on Fandango, or you might go to a shopping mall and be able to press one of those buttons and buy a phone card, but you've not seen any particular ATM that does everything, all on the same terminal, including act as an ATM machine. So the opportunities are absolutely endless in what this machine has the capability of doing. If you're in a specific region and you want a service on the kiosk, we can put it there. If you're in another state and you don't want it there because of competition or other issues, we can remove it. We have a very diverse team. Um, I've been in compliance for 22 years as a money service business, uh, specifically in the foreign currency space, wire transfer space, and check cashing space, as well as dealers in precious metals. Um, Arik is the founder. He's got a very strong IT background. Some of you may have heard the name Ivan Brightly, who worked with ZipZap uh, and, and has vast experience in this space. And we have a bunch of advisors and, and developers that are on our team to develop this product. This, this product has been in development for about two years now. So it, it's actually not a new concept. It's actually going to be launched and is being launched as we speak. We've had 50 units ordered in the last 30 days. 
Um, we just, two days ago, um, had a distributor agreement placed in Florida for a thousand machines over a three year period. Um, and we have locations being, uh, actually equipment being ordered in the Netherlands, UK, and other areas of the world. So this is some very exciting stuff for us to be able to get this product out to the unbanked and underbanked and consumers who, can, who need financial freedom and financial access. Um, what are we trying to do by leveraging it? It's a, it's a $78 billion B, billion dollar market, alternative financial solutions. So it's, it's much more than just digital currency, it's servicing the masses. Um, if, you, if, if someone has an ATM machine in their location, we'll simply replace it out. Um, it, it's just amazing what we can do with this machine and what we're going to be doing with this machine in replacing the current ATM model, and there are millions of ATMs distributed throughout the United States and abroad. Um, Kiosks and these types of machines are, are nothing new in Europe. Uh, they're very widely accepted in Europe and being used. So currently, we are seeking distributors worldwide. We are seeking investment for continued research and development, marketing and legal. Um, we will be placing machines in the next 60 days. Just yesterday, if you Google InterWallet, no space, you'll find a press release that we uh, signed the contract and we expect to have these machines in operation within 60 days or less, not necessarily with full functionality such as Bitcoin buying and selling based on legal issues, but certainly all the prepaid products uh, and, and using uh, a solution such as BitPay to be able to process transactions for consumers to pay their bills, phone cards, gift cards, uh, uh, anywhere they want, grocery stores, gas stations, liquor stores, convenience stores, and shopping malls. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, the gentleman in, in, in New York has ins to Broadway. We're also talking to Ticketmaster as an example. So if you have a, a special product that we feel will make sense to the consumer and, and, and be widely accepted in your area, we can certainly look to place that application on the kiosk in that specific area. Yes, sir. So it sounds like a great idea, but um, why do we need ATMs at all anymore? What can this machine do that my phone can't do? I don't want more cards or tickets or anything. Everything's going to be electronic. So. Um, are you bridging the gap between right now and where we're ultimately going to be? Our, our ultimate goal is to serve, serve consumers who are unbanked and underbanked. There are a lot of smartphones out there. Uh, however, not everyone has a smartphone. And it's really about access. So right now you have people standing in line at a liquor store paying a bill for a half hour on the first uh, of the month, whereas they can go to this terminal of the mall, they can go to a grocery store, this grocery store can cut down on staff, and it's really about access. So, so yes, I, I agree we're going away, but there still are millions of people who need these services. Thank you. So um, this was the first part of our startup showcase. We have more tomorrow. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now, uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Connie Galipi now from the BitGive Foundation. So uh, I think it's important to uh, keep in mind that Bitcoin is about changing the world and making people's lives better. Um, and what Connie is doing, I think, is really um, is critical because it's also about demonstrating some social value for, for Bitcoin. So over to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Connie Gallippi. I'm with the BitGive Foundation. And a little bit of a new topic, I think, for the day. I wanted to talk about creating social value with Bitcoin. So um, all the things that you know about Bitcoin also apply in a nonprofit arena. Oftentimes, we don't think about it that way. 
But if you think about um, how it blows open global access and what the kinds of impacts and, and potential we can have on giving back to charitable causes on a global scale when you have that kind of impact and access. Also, obviously, the direct transactions of peer-to-peer. -peer. The reduced fees means more of that funding goes to the actual cause and helping us to solve some of the problems we're facing today. And obviously, with Bitcoin and its increase in value over time allows us to do even even more. So um, these types of things obviously allow us to reach the need more. If you think about what's going on all over the world, needs are often in the developing countries and the third world countries. So Bitcoin actually allows us to access those areas. It also blows open for them a donor market that's on a global scale and pooling in one consistent currency. So really I mean, life changing for a lot of these organizations. Also opens up the freedom to give. Um, no controls, and holds its value in a government-controlled financial system. So if you're in Argentina, you're trying to do good work, you work in Bitcoin, and clearly you, know, you avoid all of the inflation issues, and the, the, the money that you're working with and receiving holds its value. So to me, this is a humongous opportunity. Um, Bitcoin has a very unique opportunity to look at what Bitcoin provides in providing social value. Um, it's tremendous to me, honestly. Um, and I think that it provides a real opportunity for the community to give back. Um, obviously, that there's value in improving public perception that way. But if you really think about what Bitcoin has to offer and think of it outside of the non, I'm sorry, the, the for-profit sector, there's global access, there's global impacts, and the potential is huge. Um, it really blows my mind. So that's why I started um, the BitGive Foundation, and it's really built on this premise, that there's a potential for impact on a global scale. And we created a platform for the community to give back, and we are representing the community in a very organized and professional way. And you can see we're already getting some attention from a national press like the Wall Street Journal. You may also recognize some of these faces and names. This is our team. We have Patrick Merck on our board, as well as Stephen Pear. We also have a former um, foundation administrator on our board. And then myself as the staff, um, founder and executive director, and my background is in nonprofits. Um, you can see we've got quite a bit of national press, as well as in the financial and technology arenas. Um, also, we've done quite a few presentations at conferences like this, um, as well as um, New York and Latin America and Silicon Valley. And we have quite a following on uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, so we're building this on the premise of the value of Bitcoin obviously is going up and will continue to go up. There's projections on what those percentages will be, of course, and everyone wants to know what that is. But we are really looking at building essentially what you would consider an endowment, but I don't like to use that term because it has some constraints legally. But basically, it's a long-term giving fund that leverages the increase in Bitcoin over time. So we're receiving donations now, and they're going up over time. It gives us that much more um, ability to give back on a sustainable manner and in a robust manner. So for example, some of our earliest donations at one time were 12 times their value when they were donated to us and are now at about six times their value. So it's already working. And obviously there's also these opportunities for the businesses in the community to be growing. Um, that allows us to give back more and obviously more positive impact. And you can see US News and World Report quickly picked up on what we're trying to do here. Um, I'm going to go quickly because I'm running out of time, but we really do have quite a significant amount of support from the community, and that's growing as we speak. Um, really, really appreciate all the support that we've received. Um, we've also done two campaigns. Uh, one was this Bitcoin Black Friday, and we also spearheaded this charity drive with that event. There were over 1,000 Bitcoins raised in that event with 30 different charities. And currently, we're running one with the Water Project. So please um, help us out in meeting that goal. They are providing clean, safe water to communities in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm going to skip through because I'm running out of time. But we've received quite a bit of support from the community, as well as um, quite a few events lately. 
And I just wanted to say that, um, you know, really we've laid a lot of groundwork here. We have brand recognition in the following. We've got a lot of media relationships. And the opportunities are really endless for what we can do here. Um, and we really do need your help. So we're a new organization. This is a ground floor opportunity to support us. We're looking for uh, capacity building funds. Um, we are very much volunteer um, at 100% volunteer right now. And we're also looking for in-kind support. We have a um, booth space in New York in a few weeks and we're looking for a sponsor to help us get um, some materials. And then of course we'd love donations for the long-term giving fund to leverage the increase in Bitcoin over time. So thank you very much. Uh, please come see me. I have cards with our QR code if you feel like supporting us today. Thank you.